Will democracy survive in the next couple of years? And essentially we are the same. And there are so many needs that Minnesota has. What people are saying they need right now. Access to democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Crutchfield Dermatology, a full-service treatment center in Medispa in Egan. Their goal is to help you look good and feel great with beautiful skin. With service built around courtesy, dignity, and respect, Mayo-trained Dr. Charles Crutchfield personally treats each patient and is acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. Firefly Credit Union, with locations throughout the Twin Cities, has proudly served Minnesotans since 1925. Firefly guides its members forward by delivering customized financial solutions to improve their lives in all aspects of banking. Firefly Credit Union, they light the way with life illuminated. Edina Eye, physicians and surgeons, a division of Twin Cities Eye Consultants, has proudly served the Twin Cities for more than 55 years. Now in seven convenient locations, using the most advanced technology combined with human touch, Edina Eye offers comprehensive services but dedicated specialists committed to excellence with innovative procedures and expertise for the most advanced eye care. Welcome to Access to Democracy. Alan Miller with you, and we have a, a longtime guest, a favorite guest, and a man whose life has just taken a large, large turn. Uh, we have former, I find it hard to say that, former Supreme Court Justice David Lillehag, who just stepped down from the Minnesota Supreme Court on July 30th, and we'll talk about that, but uh, welcome, Justice Lillehog. Thanks, good to be with you for what must be your nine millionth show. Yeah, just, just about. <laughs> uh, it's interesting, now you've had an incredible background. Uh, um, Lauda, uh, episode at Harvard Law School, uh, you went on to become the U.S. Attorney for the state of Minnesota. Uh, then you had a couple of shots at uh, elected office, and you ended up for a number of years in private practice with uh, Frederickson and Byron. Uh, and then in 2013, you were selected by governor, the then governor, uh, for the Minnesota Supreme Court, where you have served with, I, I, I can say, uh, knowledgeably great distinction until 2020, July 31st of this year, uh, when you resigned your position. And let's talk about that uh, a sure. little, because that came as a surprise to uh, everyone, and you had your reasons. I did. Actually, I gave a fair amount of notice. I announced in June of 2019 that mm -hmm. I'd been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and I needed to uh, find a way of life uh, where I could get more exercise, uh, spend more time with my family. And so I announced in June of 2019 that I'd be resigning on July 31, 2020. That gave the governor plenty of time to advertise for the position, accept applications, and he chose a distinguished successor, judge, now Justice Gordon Moore, who has been sworn onto the Minnesota Supreme Court. And yeah, we haven't seen any decisions by him yet but we've seen a lot of decisions by you. And uh, one of the most moving things about you uh, was really the, the ceremony that was had on your last day uh, where the other justices talked of their experience of working with you for seven, uh, for seven years. And I'm going to read just some of the remarks because that was on Zoom, and uh, as we are now, uh, your retirement, you were known uh, among your peers as a prob uh, problem solver, a consensus builder, agile and creative solutions to really thorny problems, 
famous for your hypotheticals that you ask both of your peers and of the attorneys appearing before you, a great sense of humor, a deep, deep sense of justice, importance of listening, and you really taught several of the other justices, uh, they said, to appreciate the importance of listening and not just talking. Uh, your ability uh, to craft decisions uh, and your humanity. Uh, also the aid to aspiring lawyers uh, that, that you gave. So it, it was really very moving to hear what your peers thought of you. And I know you were a consensus builder on the court uh, and they all mentioned that, and that's really one of your most important attributes. So, uh, reflecting back on your seven years, what memories do you take away from the court? Well, maybe I should end the interview right now. I've got nowhere to go but down. That was <laughs> July 31st was a wonderful day. In lieu of the traditional farewell reception, the court held a special session of the court that was uh, live streamed and recorded. And each of my colleagues um, had the chance to say a few things about me. And I'm not going to argue with your summary. I could not have wished for a nicer farewell with the greetings from my former colleagues. Well, I kind um, of short. We could have gone for an hour of just with the kind things that they had to say. Yeah, maybe you could just run that video and that would be enough. Uh, <laughs> Well, as far as reflecting on service in the court, um, let's focus on the question of consensus building uh, because that's what several of my former colleagues mentioned and it's something I feel very strongly about. And it goes to the nature of the institution of the court. The Minnesota Supreme Court historically has been seen as a professional, careful, justice-seeking court, not filled with politics, not filled with personal disputes, as some other Supreme Courts around the country have been. Like and a neighbor in Wisconsin. Uh, uh, the Badger State, yes. Right. It, it, there couldn't be a, a bigger divergence in the quality of justice from the politics of the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the really measured, uh, fair approach of the Minnesota Supreme Court, which is noted around the country, by the way. I think that's right. And part of maintaining that reputation is maintaining collegiality, not just on a personal basis, but on a professional basis. And part of that then is when you take a tentative vote, I think it's important that you go around the room once again and see if there's some holding, some rule of law on which everyone can agree that will resolve the case and end up with a unanimous court rather than a split court. And the Minnesota Supreme Court has been amazingly successful in that regard. Uh, I think during the seven years that I was on the court, about 80% of our decisions were unanimous. And that is an outstanding record. And there were not that many four to three decisions that would indicate a splintered court. And you may say, does that mean you're giving up your deeply held convictions? No, absolutely not. There are some cases where I just couldn't agree with the majority. And I felt perfectly free and in fact, Opinion that I hope would influence the state of the law down the road and eventually get the court and the legislature maybe to come around to my point of view. It didn't happen very often. I think during my last couple years on the court, I wrote two dissents. So that institutional legitimacy is Blind partisanship will do, not only in the Wisconsin court, but right here in terms of the legislature in Minnesota, where uh, one party is just so upset that the governor uh, was elected and can call an emergency session that they want to take that power unto themselves. And as a result, we haven't had a bonding bill. We haven't had uh, really a good approach to the coronavirus uh, 
epidemic pandemic that that's plaguing us and so many of our brethren and uh, yes collegiality if you can do it and if you can find that middle ground is so important and you managed to do it and that's one of the things that they all said when i say they all i meant your your other judges on the court uh, all said that they would miss very much and would that the new judge has the capability uh, i don't know him uh, judge gordon will have him on hopefully uh, and we'll we'll see where we go but it if he won't come on your show alan just let me know and we'll work him over okay i i will um, uh, on your on your broader you. point alan one thing that's concerned me about legislating and governing generally is this idea that everything has to be linked to everything else there are some things that you just have to do because they're good for the people and not try to link it to some other thing that you want that's why we have the single subject provision in the state constitution which supposedly is supposed to present prevent garbage bills where everything gets piled in at the same time and you essentially log roll and buy all the votes this idea that um, you, you can't do good for the people, such as by passing an infrastructure bill, whether at the federal level or the state level, unless you get everything else that you want or some major thing that you want, um, I think that's very problematic. On the court, what we tried to do, and I think very successfully, is you decide each case on its merits, case by case by case. You don't say, well, and this does not happen on the Minnesota Supreme Court, you don't say, if you vote my way on this case, I'll vote my way on that case. You have to decide cases as they come before the court. And I kind of wish our other branches of the government would uh, start approaching things in that fashion. I, I certainly do. And uh, it's what marks the court as singular in that regard uh, and really as recognized in that regard. Now, on a personal level, uh, it was shocking to all of us uh, to hear that you had Parkinson's. My, my father had Parkinson's, as a matter of fact, and that's many moons ago when treatment was very different. But uh, how are you doing treatment-wise and otherwise? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, I'm in the early stages of the disease. Uh, it's controllable by medication, which I take faithfully. And as I mentioned, um, part of the treatment and part of dealing with Parkinson's is making sure that you get as much exercise as possible. And I am really trying hard to do that. I, I wasn't really a high school or college athlete, but I found ways to get out and about and do things to get the heart pumping and the blood flowing and build some muscle. And so that's what I'm trying to do. We actually had a major trip to Europe that would have meant an immense amount of walking and hiking scheduled for September. And of course, the pandemic blew all that up. I'm not whining too much about it because we're very, very lucky, my, my family and I. Um, but if yeah, well, you I, can't I just, whine about it uh, too much because we had one that required a lot of walking. And, and I'm certainly your senior. Uh, in October, uh, a Viking cruise with visits to a lot of cities. And uh, that of course went by the wayside. We had another trip to visit family uh, and that went by the wayside. So uh, uh, we live in a, in a time when we hope we're dealing as best we can. And thank God then for all of Minneapolis's lakes and trails. Um, we have really grown even further to appreciate them. And so I'm putting in a very large number of steps every day lifting weights, uh, doing exercises, and trying to stay as fit as possible. And that's one of the ways you deal with this disease. Well, I'm supposed to be doing exercise, but I, I pretty much have limited my exercise to two walks a day with the dog who asleep at my feet. And uh, at least we go to a different park. We're very lucky in Egan. We have uh, just a number of great parks and uh, where I can go walk the dog and we get out twice a day. So I guess that counts as exercise because she, she does travel and I travel behind her, so. My wife and I live in Minneapolis. We have a dog as well. Um, I've been very sorry that the Kenilworth Trail has been shut down by light rail construction. I don't wanna get into that policy thicket, um, but we're doing the best that we, we can to remain very active. And of course, uh, 
it's just the two of you at home with the dog now, right? Well, there's actually a third one during the summer. My daughter is spending the summer with us, oh, and she's right. got a dog. We've got a, Winifred and I have a big yellow lab, and she's got a tiny Chinese pug. So it's pretty funny to see those two dogs running around together. But I'm telling you more than you care to know. No, no, no. Uh, we're very interested. That's, that's the whole purpose of it. Uh, we're going to uh, miss you on the court, but we don't want to miss you in our lives. And, well, uh, I, I'm pleased, by the way, that you have a dog. I, I love the book you and your wife did about your, um, your dog of blessed memory. And so oh, yeah. glad you've got a dog. My name was Toby. We've had, uh, we had a Springer since Toby. And unfortunately, he, he was a great dog, but only lasted a few years, a rescue. And now we have Katie. And she is also a rescue, and we've had her for six years now. She's about eight and a half. Uh, we don't know. She didn't come with papers, but uh, uh, we want her counted in the census anyway, despite what the president says. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it's certainly something that adds a lot to your life. And. Uh, what about the practice of law? Uh, are you going to give that a shot or? Uh... I'm going to do some of it. Um, I don't think I would be very happy and my wife tells me I would not be happy if I didn't have the intellectual stimulation of practicing law. I'm going to try to spend about a third of my time doing that, making sure that the other two thirds of my time is for the things that I've already described and need to do. Um, I don't know exactly how it's all going to shake out, but interesting cases have always come my way. And I've got to believe that that's probably going to happen again. And maybe with my experience as a Supreme Court justice, even more interesting things will come my way. Well, let, let's hope so. And of course, we're conducting this interview on a really uh, what should be a very solemn day of memory, 9-11. It's just 19 years ago today that the Twin Towers went down and we had that horrific loss of life uh, and in many ways, something that changed our lives uh, 19 years ago today. Yeah, and blessed to be the memories of the, the people who died on 9-11. Where were you on 9-11, Alan? Oh, well, we were here, but my son-in-law was working in a building across the street from the Twin Towers. And uh, as a result, uh, of what happened, uh, he actually, who lives out on Long Island, had to walk across the Brooklyn Bridge and walk for miles before he could get home that evening. Uh, and, you know, really still remembers the horror of it all. Yeah, we had no friends or relatives who were directly affected by the terrorist acts, but I do remember very, very well where I was. I was active in politics at the time, and before going to work, I uh, decided I would drive around Northeast Minneapolis and check out the lawn signs, because it was the Minneapolis mayoral primary that day. And I remember then hearing on the radio that a plane had hit the World Trade Center, and my, in my mind's eye, I was just imagining a small private plane and thinking, well, that's just horrible. And then once I got into work, the reality of it, uh, of course, took us all uh, away for that day and for many days thereafter. And of course, we had the very brave people, including the gentleman from uh, Minnesota who forced the uh, plane down in Pennsylvania. We had the plane that hit the uh, uh, city of Washington and hit the Pentagon. Uh, it was a day full of unfortunate memories. Well, I see today both President Trump and Vice President Biden have been to Shanksville, Pennsylvania to honor the dead there. And you're absolutely right. They were heroes with a Minnesota connection. I don't want to get, uh, not much, I don't want to get uh, political, but of course the president wasn't there and uh, I expect nothing less of him because I expect nothing of him uh, except aggravation and chaos, and he certainly has supplied that. Uh, but I don't want to get you into politics. I can take care of that. Uh, so uh, tell me this, uh, as you look at what's going on in Washington now, 
what's your observation about the Attorney General of the United States, uh, Attorney General Barr? Because uh, I just find his conduct so appalling uh, and so unlawyer-like and so political that it really, really is distressing to me to think that he is a member of the bar. Well, I'm very concerned about the state of the Department of Justice. And um, I grew up during Watergate. In fact, uh, Watergate came to full flower during my time in college. It was one of the main reasons why I became a lawyer. I noticed that there were lawyers really at the center of Watergate as prosecutors, as judges, even the president of the United States, but also as defendants. And that was a great concern to me. And I thought I need to be one of the people who are defending the rule of law. And that's what I've tried to do during my professional life. I tried to do that as US attorney in the 1990s and tried to do that as a member of the Minnesota Supreme Court. And so the reputation of the Department of Justice having been an alumnus of the department is of great concern to me. And there are things that are just inexplicable about this attorney general's actions. I can't see dismissing a prosecution after uh, an indictment, a trial, and uh, a sentencing. And that two not, guilty pleas. That, that has not been fully explained. Yeah, two, two guilty pleas there. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you just can't explain that. Uh, I can't, uh, I do understand removing a civil case to the federal court, but I don't understand in the one that just got removed, I don't understand uh, that the circumstances in that case justify removal uh, because I don't think the, the president defaming a woman uh, is necessarily within his duties as president. But of course we have learned uh, over the last three uh, and a half plus years that uh, this president doesn't play by the same rules as everybody else. Well, the other thing that, um, to my mind, Alan, is inexplicable is um, the idea that this attorney general is essentially un generally undoing everything that a special prosecutor was, was doing. The whole idea behind a special prosecutor is to insulate that person from politics. And whatever you think of Robert Mueller, um, he was appointed special counsel in a nonpartisan fashion. People across the spectrum agreed that he would be good, and his reputation was and is solid. And so the idea that an attorney general, after the special counsel resigns, seeks to undo all the work, that casts a great deal of doubt on the integrity of the system. And on the integrity of the person who uh, really led the charge to undo it. And even the parameters uh, that Mueller was given were, were pretty restrictive. Uh, had he been able to go into the Russia question more, I suspect that we would have had uh, a, uh, a much stronger impeachment hearing. Well, and when, when he did, when Mueller did generate his report, it got sat on for a while, but the initial word out of the attorney general's office did not, to my mind, very closely resemble what the report eventually looked like when revealed. So um, I've got a lot of concerns about the independence of the Department of Justice, and I, I'm, not, I'm not a lone alumnus in that regard. There are thousands of alumni of the Department of Justice that ex express their concern by way of letters um, that have been signed after each of these acts. And uh, yeah, and I, I certainly hope that it, it does good. Now you followed uh, a favorite of mine and a great justice onto the Supreme Court, Paul Anderson. And uh, I think that you really continued the tradition uh, that he established and uh, to your credit. Uh, but when you were on the court, what was the most interesting case that comes to mind that, that you were involved in? The most interesting case I was involved in is oddly one where the court decided not to decide a key question. And that was the lawsuit commenced by the legislature against the governor. Um, to, this, to review some, well now history a few years old, the governor and the legislature reached the end of the session and reached an agreement on what was to go happen going forward, but it did not, did not preclude the governor from vetoing bills. 
and he vetoed the legislature's appropriation, did a line item veto. And the leg but he, and he would not call back the legislature until they acceded to some of his priorities. And the legislature, instead of uh, negotiating with the governor, there was some negotiation, sued the governor. And it eventually reached the Minnesota Supreme Court. We learned that the legislature had hidden in the mattress 20 to $25 million by which it could continue to, to survive in the off session. And because of that, we decided not to decide the big looming constitutional question. Did the governor's veto of the appropriation of the legislature violate the separation of powers and prevent the legislature from being a legislature? And we said, we're going to defer deciding that until the beginning of the next legislative session and governor and legislature, you go see if you could work it out. We even ordered the governor and the legislature to mediate their dispute. And eventually they did work it out. And so we didn't have to decide the big, hairy, looming constitutional question. I thought that was the most interesting case on which I was involved in my seven years on the court. Now you've had some really interesting dissents in some of your cases. Uh, what case pained you the most uh, that you had to dissent in? Actually, uh, the case that pained me the most ended up with a happy ending. And the case was called Axelberg versus Commissioner of Public Safety. A woman and her husband, I, th I think maybe I've told you this story before, but it's been several years. A woman and her husband decided to go up north somewhere nice uh, for a, a weekend, and a, it was very warm in the Twin Cities. They got up north, checked into a cabin in a resort, and then they went to the resort and had dinner and started drinking. They drove back late at night to their cabin and got into a very serious argument. The husband punched his wife a couple of times in the head, and she jumped into the car to try to escape and lock the, the car with the keys. He jumped up on the hood of the car and started beating on the windshield and eventually so hard that it broke the windshield and so that she was in, in fear of his life. He was absolutely enraged. She put the key in the ignition, turned it on, drove to the resort. He ran after her and almost caught up with her by the time she got to the resort where they were separated by bystanders. So what happened? Well, he got charged with domestic assault. She got charged with DUI, driving under the influence. And in the immediate, act, she pleaded it down to, I think, reckless driving. But then the commissioner of public safety um, nullified or suspended her driver's license uh, because she was driving at an intoxication level of over 0.08. And the question was, did she have the right in that license revocation proceeding to say, I had to do it. I was in fear of bodily injury or, or even death. And I had to do this to get away from my abusive husband. On a four to three decision, the court said, no, she did not have the right to assert that defense of necessity. I saw room in that law for her to do that. And I said so in my dissent, which was the lead dissent among the three dissenters. And shortly after that opinion came out and my dissent came out, the legislature fixed the law. So if that situation ever happens again, you can plead the defense of necessity in a license revocation proceeding. Not only did the legislature fix it and the governor signed the law, the legislature passed the fix by a unanimous vote in both houses of the Senate and the House. So uh, it was a very concerning case from my standpoint, but there was a gratification at the end of it that the legislature had read my dissent and had done the right thing. And uh, certainly... I wonder if that couple is still together today. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, I've been tempted multiple times in, in a number of cases to kind of pick up the phone and do some of my own investigation, but I, um, I generally don't do that. No, I, I can understand. A case yeah. is a case, and when the case is over, it's over. I have a few more things that I wanted to discuss with you, but we've actually used up our interview time, so you know, what this means is that you're going to have to come back at some point in the future and pick up on things like, should judges be forced to retire at 70? Should judges have to raise money for their reelection and things like that? And I'm going to leave those questions hanging uh, so that we can entice you back. And I would be happy to come back, Alan, whether it's for your 10 millionth show or whenever. 
Well, actually, we're, we're in our 21st year now. Uh, <clears throat> I never imagined doing Zoom interviews in our 21st year, but then after the first interview with uh, Tim Pawlenty, which I did terribly, uh, I never thought that the show <laughs> would take off as it has. So uh, I want to thank you so much, uh, Honorable David Lillehog, uh, recently retired from the Minnesota Supreme Court. Uh, a pleasure, and we will have you back and continue this in the future. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. My pleasure.